Hey, hey, folks, here we are. We might be drunk. We're back. We got a hot guest. How you doing, Judd? I'm happy to be here. Couldn't couldn't be happier. You you called today. Yeah. And you texted and you said, "Are you free?" And I was. I'm not. I'm usually not even in New York. Yeah. And just I, I saw you doing something at the, at the 92nd Street Wine. I was like, Judd's in the, and give the new book. So that's right. I'll be uh, there tomorrow with Rami Youssef. Hey, nice. we love Rami. You can go. Does this run before that? No. Yeah. Fuck. April 25th. Oh man, you missed it. I, I assume it went well, but was empty because I didn't plug it here. <laughs> I heard you killed and didn't get slapped. Exactly. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. That's all that matters. That's all we want at this point. You're doing The Tonight Show right after this. I am, yes. Showbiz. Showbiz. I got things to push. I got the bubble on Netflix April 1st. I've got the book, Sicker in the Head. I have a George Carlin documentary coming out at the end of May. Can't wait. I have three things to, to pedal. Your machine, man. I mean, the Shanling doc was incredible. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Love this it. one is crazy. I mean... It, I was scared to make it because I only met George Carlin once. I interviewed him when I was like 20 years old for Canadian television. And it was the only interview I couldn't find. Ah. Literally, of his whole career, the only thing I looked for that did not exist was me as a young idiot talking to him for Canadian TV. I wonder if, they, if you go up there, they have it. I begged it. I, I called all those people. You know what did exist? Paul Reiser's sister interviewed him for her college radio station in like 1971. Hmm. And Paul Reiser had the tape. Wow. And she did a really good interview. It was right when he grew the beard and uh, grew the hair. You know, he, he went from being a little corny yeah. to, to edgier. And the story uh, that they tell about it is they do it at their apartment in New York City. I know, well, maybe they lived on Long Island, but anyway, n near the city. He comes over. She does the interview, and afterwards he says, "I gotta go. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go uh, buy a camera." And their dad says, "I'll take you. I know a guy on the Lower East Side. He'll, get, he'll give you a good price on a camera." And they go with him, and George Carlin buys a camera. They're all like in the car together. Wow! And then she sees him a year later. I guess she gets another interview with him somehow, and she asks him about the camera. And he said, uh, yeah, no, I didn't want to get a camera. I was actually trying to go uptown to buy cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Wow. I met him once. Oh, sorry. No, no, go I ahead. met him once and he couldn't have been more Carlin-y and I loved it. He did a book signing at Borders. I skipped work to go there in Wall Street and I waited in line and I was so excited. I had like three books. When Jesus Bring the Pork Chop, Brain yeah. Droppings, all that shit. I'm a huge fan. Napalm and Silly Putty. Napalm and yeah. Silly Putty. That was the other one. And I could hear people in line going, I loved you in Jersey Girl. I loved you in uh, Dog Bun. I'm like, ah, oh, what are you, Bill and Ted, that was great. I'm like, what are you doing? We got Brain droppings. Yes. <laughs> New uh, back in town, uh, complaints and grievances, you know, yeah. stuff, football, baseball, the whole thing. And I went up to him and I just unloaded on him. And he goes, what do you do? He's like, stop me. And I go, I'm a comedian. He goes, you sound like a comedian. And I go, thank you. And he goes, you got a real talent for jacking around. <laughs> But I'll take it. Uh, he signed the book. We got a photo. I think he was nice to comedians. Yes. Because I, I, I kept hearing from people. They would meet him once and he would say, give me your number. I'll, I'll check in on you. And sometimes like randomly, like eight months later, he would go, how's it going? And yeah. he would just be nice to people. Shanling has that story about how he met him. You know, he, he yes. went down there and he said, it's not great, but there's something funny on every page. Yeah, he gave it. He wanted to write jokes for him. And one of the bits he wrote for him was a commercial for legalized marijuana huh. <laughs> oh my God. back in like wow. the early 70s. Yeah, and he Time said- Time has really changed. It's really crazy. Oh, yeah. My mom used to hide my weed. Now she she just took weed for her A doctor gave her weed for her <laughs> yeah. headache. There you go. <laughs> she used to hide my- I told her, yeah. like, do you think this is a little ironic? And she was like, no, it's, I have headaches. I'm yeah. Like, I'm still- I always say weed and cigarettes change, change places. Yeah. My yeah. mom used to smoke. Then she- Now she has weed. Yeah. They well, it's, it's, you know, it's weird now as a parent because it's legal. And so you have kids. Right. And you're just like, <laughs> you can't do that. And they're like, no, it's a fully lawful thing to do. It's their beer. Right. right at this point. Yeah. And so, we, and also on some level, and you can't really say it out loud, would you be happier if they were smoking weed than drinking? Of course. So are we steering our kids to the weed? We weed, are. Weed seems more peaceful, but it also seems like drinking with family is easier because drinking yeah. is suppressing stuff. Weed, you're like, you're like, does my mom not like me? Really, you know, you're having bad thoughts. Yeah, I don't know. My I, mom yeah. just told me she didn't like, me, so I didn't need the weed. But yeah, 
So um, it's clear. Yeah. You know, I, I, there's so much I want to ask you about. Like, obviously, the book is, I, 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 I'm only like, I've only read a few of the interviews, but mm-hmm. they're, they're awesome. But I, I mean, there's, I think you were talking to uh, Cameron Crowe about yeah. James L. Brooks being a mentor. Mm-hmm. Whoa. James L. Brooks yeah. is, I feel like, one of the most legendary. Yes. Taxi. Simpsons. Taxi, Simpsons. Yeah. I mean, the Mary Tyler Moore show, and then he was producing all the spinoffs like Rhoda and and Lou Grant and right. Broadcast News. And there's the things that people don't remember as well. He wrote a funny movie with, that starred Burt Reynolds and Candace Bergen that was really, really funny. And I worked for him on The Critic. Whoa. We do recommendations every yeah. week on this. Yeah. The Critic has been a recommendation because they're all on yeah. YouTube. Yes. Uh, it's one of the best shows. Yeah, because it was the guys from The Simpsons. It was Mike Reese and Al Jean yeah. who created it. And it was the, John Lovitz as like a Roger Ebert guy. Right. And it had tons right. of parodies in it. <laughs> and it looked like a big New Yorker drawing. Yes. And that was really my first job on a show with a story. I, I used to work half the week on The Critic and half the week at Larry Sanders. Mm. Oh and then God. James Brooks would come Jesus. in and he was like so brilliant. And we would we, we would have to pitch him our ideas for stories. And you'd wait because he was a busy guy to get him to make an appointment, to sit with the writers, to hear everyone's ideas for stories. And I always remember him stumbling in the room and we're about to pitch our ideas and we all have our little pads with our ideas. And he's like, you know, I was thinking a, a, what a good story could be. He pitches us three ideas, gets up, walks out of the room. <laughs> Mm. Like, f- didn't remember why he was there. All his ideas were better than our ideas. Yeah. And then just, do you remember just left. I do remember one thing that he said to me on my pitch, which I do think shows you what a genius he is. My pitch was that, that it was, uh, the guy's name was Jay, the, the critic, that his parents are, are really rich in, in the show. And, and I think it's supposed to be like he's adopted and they're very waspy. And and she's, and he, she and talks he's very like Jewish. Uh, Catherine Hepburn. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, and the dad is kind of losing it right. a, a yeah. little bit, like a non sequitur guy. And so they get in a plane crash is the idea. And they're on a de- they're, now they're on a deserted island, the parents. And my idea was that Jay finds out that they were like part of the, you know, what do they call that? The Illuminati or something like they run the world. They're so uh-huh. rich. And now he is on the committee uh-huh. to run the world because the parents died. Right. But then you cut to the to the uh, the place where the desert island where they are. And I didn't really have an idea for that. And James Brooks said, what if on the island, you know, they've, their marriage is really stale. And it's been still for a long time. But on this island, they kind of rebuild their world with like trees and twigs and they remake it on the island. They're, they look kind of sexy, like they're kind of cut up a little bit and they're dirty and they fall in love and it gets hot again. Yeah. That's how great he is. That's like that's like, what he took from my dumb idea. Right, right. He went Blue Lagoon on it. He did. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Damn. He just goes to like character going deep. Yeah, you know, t- stories about love and connection and all the ways we're neurotic. And and I think that's why he's such a great producer, because you know, he produced Big. He produced wow. Bottle Rocket. He produced wow. Jerry Maguire. Yeah. He produced wow. um, the first Cameron Crowe movie that he directed, Say Anything. Oh, wow. Uh, you know, so he's also the, the best guy to read your stuff and tell you how to make it better. Yeah. But that must be terrifying because he, cause you know he's that good at exactly. it. Exactly. You know all his pitches are better than what you're, you're yeah, trying to do. I'm, I'm always intimidated everywhere I go. Yeah. Oh, there's Dave Attell. There's Chris Rock, yeah. whatever it is. I mean, I can't imagine going to work with these guys. Mm. That's insane. Yeah. I would be freaking out. Did it, it, it ever I, become It was normal? scary. It really w- was scary. I used to, When I was really young, you're not in a position of power. So you don't really get to choose what jokes or what stories get done. Mm-hmm. So as an entry level writer, all you're doing is vomiting out. What if, what about this? What about this joke? What about this thing? And then they just say, yes, no, yes, no. And, and if you don't mind being rejected 80%, 90% of the time, it's a, it's a good job. And then slowly you start getting access to the conversation about what stories should we do. Right. Oof. Terrifying. Yeah. Was, who, who was, was James the most intimidating person you worked for coming up? I mean, he wasn't intimidating necessarily because he did something that I think a lot of good comedians do. It's when you would pitch him something, he never said it was bad. So if I pitched a bad story, he would like sit and think and go, 
what could you do with this? Mm-hmm. He never gave you that look like, you idiot. Right. You know, so even the worst idea, he's like, what? And he would sit and he would try to what if it for a while to see if it led to something else. And I, that was the main lesson I learned from him was, okay, this is like a starting point for someone else's inspiration. Yeah, we, we write together and we'll do that too. I you, never go, that's... You're so good at that, actually. Oh, Mark, I'm, Mark and I, since we were open micers, would bounce bits. And, yeah. uh, and Mark, we, we, I have some friends who like, you t- tell a bit to and they're just like, ugh, you know, <laughs> but, but Mark is always like, what if it, what if it was this? I think this is what you're trying to say. He's very yeah. encouraging. So, well, there's usually a nugget, a kernel. We can yeah. go another way. There's always something. Well, yeah. something's bubbling up, right? Exactly. And I think that that's how I, I, I've tried to look at writing, which is why am I thinking about this? Like right. something from my unconscious is trying to get out. And I don't know why. And usually whether that's a script or a joke, like, why, why do I want to talk about, you know, having babies? Yeah. You know, why is that on my mind? I mean, I think someone said, like, you write the movie to figure out why you're writing the movie. Oh. And sometimes you don't know till you finish it. What is it really about these relationships? Like, right. Like, when I was a kid, you know, my dad got remarried, my mom got remarried. I didn't think that much of it. It was always an adjustment. You'd be awkward for a while. It's new people in your life. And I worked with Pete Davidson on King of Staten Island for a few years. And it, what is it about? It's about getting comfortable with what's going to be your stepdad, Bill mm, Burr. Right. But while we're doing it, I'm not that conscious of, uh-huh. oh, I have all these issues. Yeah. The resistance to like loving the new person that's trying to figure you out. Well, uh-huh. so you were, you were yeah. relating, you're looking at it through Pete's lens with that movie. Yeah. Interesting. And, but I didn't think about it maybe that much, even while we were writing it and doing wow. it. Oh, this is weirdly personal for me in trying to build those relationships and and how it takes a little Was time. that what, do you think on some level that's what drew you to work with Pete? I mean, aside yeah. that he's interesting, that he's someone that makes sense to work with, but but do you think when you're like, when you're, are you helping him kind of st- structure that story? That's part of it is... I mean, in the beginning, we were talking about just like silly ideas. Mm. So uh, him and Dave Cyrus wrote another idea for me, and it was just a silly idea, and it wasn't really coming to fruition. And then usually we have a a moment where I'll just say, what should we be writing about? Uh And then he kept talking about wanting his mom to date, and that kept coming up as a theme, feeling bad that his mom isn't dating. Right. And then it was like, well... How honest do you want to get? Yeah. How deep do you want to go? And then slowly he's like, yeah, I wouldn't mind writing about it. Because it's sacred, you know, talking about sure. losing your dad and, and what his life has been like, what his family's life has been like. And then you start saying, would your family care if you wrote about this? And he's like, oh, no, they'd love it. Oh, all right. Uh, all right. How honest can we get? Yeah, completely. And most people will say, well, we can say this, but we can't say yeah. that. And Pete yeah. was always... We're all in. And then he's, I called his mom been, and we talked about it and started writing. He's wow. been so in the public scrutiny since, what, like 18? <laughs> yeah. That it, it probably helps being that open a book because he's just like, you can't hurt me. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I'm sure you can, but you know what I mean? Like comedically, almost nothing's sure. off limits in that way. Well, public scrutiny since 9-11 because he said he, he they would take all the kids to Yankee games and football wow. games. And yeah. They're all... You know, everyone was trying to make them feel better. And, mm. he, and, he, and he's talked a lot about this publicly, just how uncomfortable it made him because it wasn't a normal form of getting over sure. a loss. Yeah. Hey, yeah. your dad's gone, go watch Jason Giambi right yeah, there. Exactly. <laughs> go to yeah, the White not, House and that's meet not, the president. Right, right. <laughs> you know, and, that's not helping. Yeah, yeah. of course. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> that's it, it's true. interesting because I'm, I'm, I think about your work and like you kind of have a levels where uh, like – You'll do something that's a little more silly, but then you'll go and kind of go, like even like undeclared to freaks and geeks. There's mm-hmm. such different tones. Yes, mm. yeah. Well, I always thought that undeclared, like college, is like the gift you get for surviving how shitty high school is. Oh. So it seemed like after this brutal high school experience, that if you did a show about college, it would be that's the place you go to redefine yourself. Right. Everyone thinks I'm an idiot here. I'm gonna go there. No one knows who I am. Can I act cool enough? to be accepted as a different kind of person. And then slowly they they figured out. I remember there was an episode where Martin Starr played his friend from back home mm-hmm. who was, you know, like a nerdy guy. And that's when he felt like he was going to be outed as not the cool person yeah. he was trying to 
pretend that he was. Right, And right. that's what I always thought at college. Like, this is the moment that I can, like, put everything behind me. Yes. And people will think I'm cool. And I remember, like, drinking with all the football players during the, the first week of school and just vomiting yeah. immediately and instantly being a loser again. They don't know I'm a dork. <laughs> exactly. But then after college, you're punished with marriage. Exactly. You know? <laughs> punished high school, fun college. The rest of your life sucks. <laughs> well, I no, don't look at it that way. <laughs> I'm about to have my 25th wedding anniversary. Holy Congratulations, hell. Or it's man. a dream. There you for go. a quarter century. Yeah. yeah. And now your kids are cooking. They're they're rocking and rolling. They're working. Iris is in the bubble. Iris is in the bubble. And she's really, really funny. She plays a TikTok star who's been jammed into the movie just because she has a lot of followers and doesn't know how to act. <laughs> and Realistic. she was on Love and was really funny in that. And then Maude is on Euphoria. Right now, yeah, I haven't seen it yet. Everyone Woo! pitching it to me, it it sounds terrible. I don't want to watch kids on drugs. You do, you, you do. do. It's <laughs> fun. I hear it's amazing. I'm terrified. It's a great show. It's just they push the limits. It's wild. It's I gotta crazy. watch it. It's fun. HBO still does make some cool stuff. Oh, HBO is the best. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's it's amazing to just watch. Yeah, her do it. Like learn. You know, she's you watch. She's, I mean, I've only gotten to the set twice, but just her talking about it, the process of. Everybody figuring out the show. Sam Levinson writes and directs every episode. Whoa. It's a pretty remarkable feat. Man. And then you see what they did, and you can't believe how, how good it is. Because like for me, I'm working so hard, and at the end, you're like, God, I hope I didn't screw this up. So you know, from a distance, to observe a very long process, and then he just really sticks the landing on the whole oh, yeah. thing. Uh, I got to so impressed. It. It's heavy duty. Do you, do you yeah. feel like you set your kids up for showbiz by putting them in the movies when they were really young? I think, uh, you know, I've either helped them or ruined their lives. Because <laughs> you don't really know. Because if I talked about dentistry their whole lives, maybe they would love the teeth. Maybe they'd be an orthodontist. Maybe right. they would be an oral surgeon. And so if you only talk about jokes and storytelling and you get a kick out of it. And also you have people around. Like, they're around funny people. Yeah. And... Those people are interesting. And, you know, we can say it. They're more interesting than a lot of other people you meet. You got in that life. right. You, you know, so, and so <laughs> then you'd like the idea of being around creative people, silly people. And and then they weren't pushed into it. They just they kind of did it even though they weren't asking to do it. I was just like, well, I need to play the kids in this. I don't want to meet other people's kids. Let, let's, let <laughs> and you, you get to spend time it. with your family. Right. Yeah, we're going to hang out for three yeah. months and then, like, Two years later, we would do it again. It wasn't like all the time. Sure. But it was enough that each time they got better at it and got more comfortable. And now that they're adults, they just know how to do it. Right. It's and almost like learning a language or something. Like you, I think like so. It's like learning Spanish when you're three yeah. and then yeah. you just know it. Exactly. Or just not being terrified when you're sitting in a chair and you have to do a scene and there's like 80 people watching. Because Ooh. you've done it for such a long time that you've just gotten used to that space. Right. Because so much of acting, I think, is about being terrified. Like if you could get rid of the fear and relax, most people could do it if you if you're not self conscious. I can't do it. I've tried and I still can't act. Yeah, I can't. I can't let go. You don't act in anything. I mean, I'll do like a a little sketch here and there, like a one scene thing in in, in a movie. Uh, But you know, I was I was in the Disaster Artist as like a yeah as a a mean producer, right? And they were like, yeah, we want you to play this this like jerk producer, and I'm like, oh, that'll be fun. And they have me sit with like a really young you know, beautiful woman. And it's all like, kind of like, I'm like the creepy uh, producer who's vi- really vicious to James Franco's character. And I'm like yelling at him, like no one makes it. Even if you're great, it's a one in a million. <laughs> if you're a genius, it's a one in a million that you get the break right. and, and make it. You played and, the Tim Dillon character. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then I see the movie, I look at the credits and it says Judd Apatow as himself. Oh. <laughs> That's a nice fun zing. Yeah. <laughs> now, what about the Synergy Raw Kombucha? Well, well, now, I've never had it before. Is it strong? Is it? I don't know if you're supposed nah. to shake it up. Oh, you don't, don't shake it. It's fizzy. Don't yeah. shake. Should we get you another one? Is it oh, a bubble? Well, is it? Uh, it's live something. It's probiotics. Cultures. But is it taste good or it, is it, it does. Taste bad? Well, We're, basically, we got drunk with Burt Kreischer for three hours yesterday. Yeah. And we are hurting. There you go. Yeah, Bert was literally every round he'd be like, catch up. And we're like, all right. Yeah. So yeah. that turned into a three. It usually, as I said, around a one hour episode with Bert, it turned yeah. into a three. Yeah. Uh, and you went all the way with him. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. He's and an then, animal. And then I'm on the Tonight Show today. So you got you got to go. This is, nice. this is tea time. Yeah. This is great. I, wrote, I How I think of this is when we did the Ben Stiller show many, many moons ago, 
Andy Dick at the time was very sober and very healthy, and he drank this all the time. Really? He was always drinking this, but at the time it didn't look like this. Like this looks like Gatorade or something. Right. But back then it looked like there was like octopus in yes, it and stuff. Like yes. it was something. I don't know how they presented it, but they were living stringy things. Right. And, it was Flint and, water. And so I still think of it as disgusting like that. But I'm gonna try. It's it pretty right good. It's, they cleaned it up a little bit. They got their act together. They strained it. Mm -hmm. Do you get nervous to do a late night spot appearance? Um, I, I get a little bit nervous. This may be the least prepared I've ever been. And sometimes I think, well, is that, that good to just, because he's nice and, you know, he's funny and maybe I just need to be interesting and something will happen. And then other times I prepare like every word, like it's, it's bits. I'm I've really, seen you run it at like a, like a late night set for panel sometimes, right? Yeah. Like I've done the stories and I didn't do that this time, but this is like a very loose version of it so yeah this is the can i be interesting or you know sometimes i think you know judd you do stand-up comedy but you're also a director and a director does not have to be funny he can be interesting Ugh. so maybe i'm interesting <laughs> i do uh, one of those appearances well if you go in interesting anything you say that's slightly humorous is now a win Exactly. You know, it's like when a, a rock star yeah. does patter between songs, he's murdering. Right. You know, because you just don't expect it. Yeah. And you're like, I wouldn't even put that in my act anywhere. Exactly. When he kills. <laughs> you just see a TED talk with like a little quick joke in there, and the guy yeah. gets a huge laugh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or a funeral is a big one, too. You did a, you did a stand up set, though, on Fallon once. You I did. did. I did. It was, uh, they asked me to do a stand up set. And this is how you know they, thought I was just a curiosity and it wasn't like an earned stand-up set. <laughs> no one on the show asked to see it beforehand. But is that flattering or is that... No, I think that's because you're a star. I don't yeah. Think that's, I don't think that's because you're not, that you didn't earn it. You killed the set. I, I, yeah, I the still set. remember the Cosby joke. Yes. Uh, that's a great joke. <laughs> well, the thing was, I ran it at the cellar a bunch, the yeah. set, and I wasn't going to do the Cosby bit. And the Cosby bit was just all about Cosby hiding the newspaper so Camille wouldn't <laughs> hear that he's in trouble. Right. And um, and then it was like doing a Cosby routine about hiding the paper. And every day I would go to the driveway and I'd get up early and hide the paper. <laughs> right. And, uh, and I wasn't going to do it because I thought, oh, this is a little too much uh, to do. And then I forgot who it was, but I got off stage and somebody, could have been you, just went... Well, you got to do the Cosby thing. It yeah. might have been me, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it might have been. I, it literally, it could have been you. And I was like, really? I'm like, Yeah, I think that's like the best thing. And then I was yeah. like, all right. I mean, it, but then that became like half the set. Right, right. Sam also told Rock to do the Jada joke. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> we don't know. Every joke's an experiment. That's true. You, that's don't, true. you don't know what jokes are going to work. That's what makes it so exciting. The of failure course. can happen at any moment. I, I think for the now on the stage, you'll have to be four feet tall. Because if he have to jump up to get on the stage, I think it'll... It looks foolish. Yes, exactly. You don't, you don't want to squirm to get the slap off. Right. It doesn't look good. But the fact he could just sashay up there. Was there any step? Nothing. There was no step. Right that was the yeah. issue. Front row. No step. Even if he's in the fifth row, he's got to shimmy down. That yeah. changes things too. Yeah, it's all. It's, set design is always the problem. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Built yeah. that wall I'll, around yeah. the stage. I want to ask about because freaks and geeks. I, do you get asked about that a lot? I do, and and you know the great thing about it that's nice is when it got canceled. You really think no one may ever see it again. You don't know that it's going to come out back then, like. VHS or DVD, like that's not guaranteed that that happens. Right. And so your nightmare is it's going to go down some digital black hole and never be able to be seen again because someone has to like pay to get it out there. Mm -hmm. So the fact that it's on Hulu now, and I really think more people watch it every year than ever watched it Whoa. when it was on. And so it's almost like a new project, which I get a kick out of. And it was shot to look like something made in 1980. Right. So something about the style of it doesn't age because it's meant to be a little old looking. Mm. Yeah. And, and also there's all this music in it. You know, back then, nobody put classic rock in TV shows. The only show that did it a teeny bit was The Wonder Years. Mm -hmm. But if you watch TV, if you're watching like Lou Grant or something or NYPD Blue, they didn't put like The Grateful Dead in it. That's there was true. no music in shows. Yeah. Dawson's Creek had a little pop music uh, here and there. And we said, what if we pack this thing like a Scorsese movie? Right. Did that cost a lot of money? Well, back then, it really didn't cost that much. We budgeted for it. But say it costs like a hundred grand an episode to fill it with with songs by 
you know, Ted Nugent and yeah. Styx and, and Billy Joel and people like that. And everybody said yes. And we put Van Halen in the show. If you tried to do that right now, it, it would just cost you millions of dollars millions. per episode. Everyone has asked for an enormous amount of money mm. to do that. And now it's in all the shows. But back then, you know, we would call the Grateful Dead and they'd be like, oh, no one's ever asked for a song before. Wow. Wow. For you anything. Holy I mean, Billy Joel wasn't in any movies or TV shows. Styx was never in, yeah. in anything. So for us, it was like, oh, it's all open. Yeah. It's open season. It's a little generic now. But back then it was so fun. Interesting. I never thought about the music. That scene where Martin Starr is eating the... Yeah, what's yeah. he eating? Like meatloaf or an eclair or something? And his mouth yeah. is—he's got milk. And he's, he's eating he's, grilled cheese and Entenmann's cake. Yes, which is what I did every day as a kid. I would sit and watch Dinah Shore and eat grilled cheese and Entenmann's cake and watch the comics. That hit home. That was that was my and it was Shanling routine. in that episode, right? And I put Shanling in there as a as a respect to Shanling, and and that and I put the Who the song I'm one under it because it's uh, all about like feeling like an outcast. Man, you were just jerking it. This was an <laughs> Apatow moment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was, it was uh, and, and there was another sequence in that show where uh, Bill gets up and he uh, he's, his, he sees his mom's new boyfriend, which is his gym teacher. Mm-hmm. And then he, he takes out a mug that's his, like world's best dad. And we had this great bad finger song. Uh-huh. Um, and we couldn't get it because they were like in whatever legal problems with all, all their stuff. And it was like the saddest thing that we couldn't get this song. It was, it was like that sequence where it was so great with that song. Right. And then we couldn't get that song. And all the guys in that band were always broke and their lives were falling apart because something got fucked up in all their contracts and they oh. couldn't sell their music. Yeah. Do you feel like it's bittersweet now? Because when I started comedy, there wasn't much. Obviously, there were no podcasts back then, like in 2006. You know, I had the the CDs on comedy. Remember Woody mm-hmm. Allen had oh, one, yeah. Seinfeld had one, a couple other guys. Now there's like eight zillion comedic avenues yes. and internet shows and everything. Is it good or bad that there's this much access to comedy? Or was comedy better when it was this kind of niche underground thing? I don't know, because, you know, when I was a kid, I mean, like the book we're t- we have here, Sicker in the Head, yes. where I interview all the comics. When I did it as a, as a kid, I did it because there were, were no interviews. So other than like those weird CDs, yeah. there, there was almost nothing. So as a as a young person who wanted to know, like, how do you do it? There was nowhere to check. So you were like actually interviewing Seinfeld because you're like, I want to know how to do this. Exactly. Right. And I like, heard those old ones. And and literally, it's like 1984. Yes. Wow. And so it's before Seinfeld, but people still thought he was the greatest comic Wow, uh, and you said in the book it says something about how he was kind of icy to you, but then he saw you cared, and that kind of yeah. softened him. That's the key. Well, I showed up at the door, and I think he didn't realize it was a child. <laughs> <laughs> and so you always have to decide: Am I actually even going to do this? Right, right, now? right. And then I'm so earnest as a kid, and I love him so much yeah. that at some point he got like very kind, and yeah. and I said, "How do you write a joke?" And then he started walking me through. A premise he was working on, and the premise he was working on was uh, the, the, how do you catch a bullet between your teeth? Yes. And he saw that on That's Incredible. And he's like, well, how do you how do you learn how to do that? I mean, do you start with a grape? Do you, you know? and he, he goes, and, the, and this was the thing that made me laugh. And I learned a lot from him saying this. He said, then I started thinking, I don't remember his name. And the guy's got to think, what the hell do I need to do yeah. to get you to remember my name? And he just started showing me how his mind works. Mm, right. And, and you know, I did that with 50 different people. And you don't even realize what you're picking up. Yes. But the main thing I picked up from it was they worked their asses off. And it took like seven to 10 years to figure it out. Exactly. And so as a 16-year-old, to program in your brain, I have a goal and if I start now at like 17, I won't be good till I'm 25. Yep. And I'm okay with that. That was life changing. Because right. I think now everyone thinks they're supposed to be amazing in the first three months. Well, they could TikTok it and be, a, you know, yeah, there viral. Are people who are selling tickets on the road yeah. through, through TikTok, you know, and they don't have an act. Right. So, yeah. but, which is, sounds horrible to me. I mean, it's I great that you're making a living, but it's also like, the people that are paying money to see you are going to hate the show. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. And, and now, uh, yeah, it, everything. everyone feels like they should be a star instantly. Yes. And I really thought, oh, seven years. And I also thought, okay. Which I'm, isn't crazy, by the way. That's like, think about like any job. To be a doctor, exactly, to be a yeah. lawyer, it's like college and then law yeah, school, right? I true. mean, that seven years sounds reasonable. And, and in my head, the, what I thought was, okay, I'm 17. 
24, I'm Eddie Murphy. Uh, <laughs> That's not bad. You got to the get red to Eddie Murphy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we Might Be Drunk is brought to you by Manscaped. It's time for spring cleaning. Better start with that winter bush. Save big by going to manscaped.com for 20% off and free uh, shipping with the code DRUNK. Get your day started by trimming those wayward hairs with the waterproof lawnmower 4.0. Clear your holes and smell the spring air with the weed whacker. And also clean up with their crop preserver and crop uh, reviver. Finish up your grooming routine with the Plow 2.0, the perfect razor for the finest shave on your face. Because if you're using your lawnmower 4.0 in your balls and your face, you're doing it right. Yeah, you can't do the same. You can't do the balls and the face. That's no, pretty gross. No. You know, Manscaped has partnered with the Testicular Cancer Society to bring awareness to t- uh, testicular cancer, men's health, and early cancer detection. Manscaped. Uh, Manscaped is committed to raising awareness for the most common form of cancer in men aged 15 to 35 and giving support for fighters, survivors, and families uh, impacted by testicular cancer as part of the We Save Balls initiative. Mark, tell them how to do it. Here, here. Get 20% off plus free shipping with the code DRUNK at manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping at manscaped.com and use promo code DRUNK. It's time to throw out your old hygiene habits and upgrade your life. Support the show and get 20% off oil, off and free shipping with Drunk at Manscaped.com. Get on it, folks, and save those balls. Hey, hey, We Might Be Drunk is brought to you by Lucy. You're a responsible consumer and you want a responsible way to consume your nicotine, don't you? Well, if you're looking for nicotine gum, lozenges, or pouches to use nicotine to relax, focus, or just unwind after a long day, there's only one stop you should make. Lucy! I like this stuff. The gum tastes great. I prefer the lozenges because you can just throw them in. You're not smacking around town with the chewing. So uh, get on it. Plus, you know, it just tastes good. And it gives you a little jolt. That nicotine. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It gives you a kick. If, if I'm hungover... I pop one of those in, and I'm like, woo-wee, pretty good. <laughs> it's the least healthy endorsement of all time. Also, if you're going to the casino, you hit the slots, just chew the gum, and you, yeah. you get the same, the nicotine, without having to kill your lungs. So you've been looking for an alternative to smoking. Why not switch to nicotine product that can actually make you feel good and feel good about doing it? Tell them how, Fatty. If you enjoy using nicotine, you should definitely check out Lucy's products at lucy.co. That's lucy.co, promo code DRUNK at checkout. Also, I have to read this disclaimer, warning this product contains nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. Remember... If you're interested in a better way to use nicotine, visit lucy.co and be sure to use that promo code DRUNK. We Might Be Drunk is brought to you by Displate. Displate is a -a one-of-a-kind metal poster designed to capture your unique passions. They have millions of cool designs available featuring gaming, movies, comics, anime with officially licensed designed designs from Bethesda, Star Wars, Netflix, and many more. It only takes... 20 seconds to set up with no power tools, no damages, no frustrations. And once you mount one, you can switch out a new one in a flash. Wow. Look at that, folks. Holy hell. Look at that metal. Is it upside down? It's upside down. Oops, sorry, everybody. There you go. The triple Lindy. Yes. Uh, and with everyone that you buy, Displate will plant a tree. Tell them how, Samuel. Click the link in our description to see some of our favorite Displates and get our special discount 20 per- 23% off up to two Displates or 34% off three or more Displates, which will automatically be applied to your cart when you click the link or use code DRUNK when you visit displate.com it's an amazing deal and only available for a limited time and i mean that's a classic poster classic love and it, it it's light it's fresh it feels Whoa. good look i think it comes with some minis too look at that a magnet there super cool thank you displate get on it get your own thing did you uh so sign for when did you mention when you were a successful writer yeah. was there a point where you were like do you remember did you ever bring it up to him i think i probably waited almost like deep into my 30s to, to mention. I think at some point when I started having some success with like the 40-year-old virgin, I mentioned it and I would let people print a picture of me at 16 with Seinfeld. 
And then he's like, oh, my God. And I don't remember if he really remembered it. Right. You know, the, you know, when it happened. The funny thing is I interviewed him again the next year. And he said, why would I do it again? And, ah. I'm like, and I said to him as a kid, I'm like, well, you did The Tonight Show twice. That's and he good. did it. He did wow. like another, another hour with me. And, you know, that kindness, like when you go, oh, this is this is how you're supposed to behave towards people. Because mm -hmm. there were people who weren't nice. Yes. And and then there'd be people who'd be so nice. They would take out their phone book and go, hey, do you want to interview Rodney Dangerfield? Do you wow. want to interview so-and-so? Did you interview Rodney? I never got Rodney, but like people would just give me his, his own phone number. What? And, stuff. and Alan Zweibel from Saturday yeah, Night Live yeah. would give me people's phone numbers. And I think that was maybe the most important part of the whole process was, Oh, this this is what kindness says. Right. This is what mentorship. I've noticed is. the funny guys tend to be kind. A lot of the uh, the dicks are usually hacks. Yeah, the better yeah. comics are nicer for the exactly. most. Exactly, they're you, more self aware. Yeah. So you Seinfeld. Who, who were the other big ones you talked to when you were young that had a big impression? Well, there was there were people like Harold Ramis. Ooh, that's, that's a good one. I, he was in prep for vacation. Wow. Wow. And. I remember he started talking about writing jokes for Rodney Dangerfield and getting 50 bucks a joke. And I never knew that, like, someone would write the jokes for people. Yeah. So that was a big thing. So at 16, I'm like, oh. So Which is not really a thing anymore. I mean, I think that was, that's like an old school show biz. Thing. Yeah. I mean, I'm, if you have a TV show, obviously. Or you're doing the Oscars or something. Yeah. 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 And, there, and there are people that, yeah, there are some people who do a little bit of that if they're, like, really cranking out stuff. But it definitely programmed in my brain, oh, I can – do stand up and sell jokes to pay my rent. So mm. when I first started out, I wrote jokes for George Wallace and Taylor wow. Negron. And wow. there was, I did a session for Jeff Dunham's Old Man Puppet wow. with my friend Joel Madison. Wow. And I thought that's a cool thing to do. No one else was doing it. There weren't any other comics who were willing to spend their comedy bandwidth on they, helping somebody They held else. the jokes too dear. Yeah, they, they didn't want to do it. You know, mm. But I did it. And you know who I did it with? Norm. No way! Me and Norm and, and, I, and I believe John Regi got hired to write jokes for Roseanne. Wow. Wow. And I remember me and Norm, uh, I forgot if Regi was there, just driving to Roseanne's house, sitting at her breakfast table, and she takes out a big stack of legal pads with all of her ideas. Yeah. And and then we would like try to help her turn them into jokes. Very quickly, he got hired on Roseanne, and yep. then he got SNL like an, a few months later. Like his thing blew up. Really fast. Could you tell when hanging out? Because he's like one of my heroes. Could yeah. you tell hanging out like, oh, this guy's amazing. This guy's brilliant. Or was I he loved just too Norm weird? the second I saw him. I was living with Sandler. We were both, you know, struggling. Him less than me because he would be on remote control on MTV. And he'd, <laughs> yeah. he'd VJ every once in a while. But he, you know, so that was like a thing. There'd be like MTV tours that, sure. that Adam would go on. But Adam had a lot of energy like to succeed. And I came at it really as a fan. Mm -hmm. So I saw Norm on something. And I had the tape of it. And I'm like, Sandler, you got to see this fucking Norm MacDonald, man. Wow. This, is guy is, this is like the funniest guy ever. And I would do this to Adam all the time uh, when I liked somebody. <laughs> and he would always say like, I don't give a shit if he's funny. I'm trying to be funny. Right, right. I'm trying to make it. I don't care if he makes it. Yeah. And then the funny part is he became Norm's biggest right. supporter. And then suddenly Norm's Billy in Madison. all the movies yeah. and Billy Madison. And suddenly like Norm's around all the time. And I'm like, I told you it's Norm. <laughs> Norm's the one. Yeah. Uh, Comics also, I think we have like the arrogance that we kind of want to discover the comic ourselves. Sure. Yes. When someone yes. pushes a comic on you, it's almost like being like being pushed <laughs> to go on a date with someone. You're yes. like, hey, fuck off. I'll meet yeah. someone, you know? Yeah point well i just had also had that nerdy fan thing and sandler's thing back then he loved rodney and he worked at dangerfields and, and, and r.i.p and, that club's no longer here i yeah. know and, and that i remember doing a couple of spots there back in the day and and that was his guy he just he loved rodney and then rodney was in little nicky it's great right, right. And, right and then once we all flew to vegas to see Rodney perform when Rodney was like 80 something. Wow. And Santa like charters a jet and we all fly out there and it's like this really like funny group. It's like me, Sandler, Schneider, Covert, Carl Weathers, Carl and, my and, God. and Quentin Tarantino. That was the group. <laughs> That's and like we're a Mad Lib. and we're all just fly to Vegas <laughs> to see Rodney. That's the only rise, reason we're going, just to pay respects wow. to Rodney. And we go. Oh, and see he's him. in Natural Born Killers. I'm thinking yeah, like yeah. a Tarantino. Oh yeah. And he, and then he was great in his 80s. He was great. And then someone started heckling him, 
and he just tore the guy apart. And he woke up too to another level, and he loved destroying the guy. And then yeah. we hung out after with him, and and he's it was just such a such a character. Man, there's a oh sorry, there's, there's a great clip of Rodney. It's in the it's in the box set. Mm-hmm. Uh, which I mean I don't know if we get a box set anymore. It must be on YouTube somewhere. <laughs> but it's he's in his eighties doing stand up in Vegas. And it's not a good crowd. Mm. And it gets to a point where he's not doing great and it's mm-hmm. kinda sad. And then he it's another thing where he wakes up and mm-hmm. he just rattles joke, joke, yeah. joke, yeah. joke. And and at the end he gets a big applause break and he just goes, I know a lot of fucking jokes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the funniest thing. You're like, Yeah, I still got it. I yeah. love it. Well, I love like these old records, like like you have this one here, I don't get no respect. But Rodney's thing was, and I don't know if it was cocaine induced or, or what, he used to talk slow. Like mm-hmm. he, in the, he used to be a storyteller and he was funny. And, and he would talk like this and he would say, you ever gone to the mechanic? And so he had a whole different affect to him. And right. it was really funny and dark and weird. And then suddenly it got super fast and crazy. And I remember seeing him when I was like 13 or 14 at Westbury Music Fair. And it really was the case that Certain jokes would kill so hard that you would miss the next two. Wow. Like it was just pandemonium. And maybe he was on coke and just moving way too fast, but he murdered like I'd never seen yeah, anybody his murder. Tonight show stuff, it's always like eight million, nine million views on YouTube, yeah. still holds up, still hilarious. And long like he used to do like eight minute sets or ten minute sets. He would sit down with Johnny, do another ten minutes I know. on I know. the couch. So many I try jokes. to avoid if I do a late night set, I try to do a short <laughs> I'm like, Can I do three forty five? Right. How can I get it and not burn everything? Yeah. yeah. But back then, that was the spot to burn it. You're right. Yeah. That was like a special back then, I guess. You exactly. Know? Everybody see. in America was watching that thing. But Norm would always say he would rehearse and practice like crazy for those panel sessions. Mm-hmm. You think it's he's like a he almost looks high. He's off the cuff. He's <laughs> riffing. He's talking about moths yeah. for eight minutes. That was all prepared. Yeah, I mean, it's really fun to go down the the Norm wormhole uh, on because there's a lot of stuff. Yes. If you want to just look for like. Norm on a morning radio show 16 years ago talking for an hour and 10 minutes yeah. and being hilarious and crazy. There's so much of it. There's one, maybe even the last year of his life where he, I think it's Hawaii and it, it gets really like intense and he's just talking about life and and he gets, he's talking about like religion and masturbation and they can't tell if he's goofing on them yeah. or not. And I'm not even quite sure because I think sometimes people... They think you're joking, and then your thing is, I'm going to tell them the complete truth Yes, about everything, and you're going to think I'm goofing, but I am not goofing. Yes, and exactly. Like Andy Kaufman was on this show called like the Tom Cottle Show. He was one of the first therapists on TV who would like do therapy with a real person or a celebrity on TV. And there's a thing of it on, on YouTube. It's like 20 minutes, and you could tell Andy Kaufman has decided he's going to drop all of his character and tell the truth to this guy on tv and that's the joke wow. <laughs> and it's like you can't even believe you're watching it. also yeah. norm's cadence is so funny it's hard to picture it's just it's almost like the curse of rodney like picture rodney trying to be serious it's yeah. still kind of funny totally. he plays the darkest character ever in natural born killers and it, and it's like a laugh track you're right yeah. you right know? There's a norm on the radio somewhere, and he's making fun of teachers. And a teacher yeah. calls in, and she's like, you don't know how hard it is. And he's like, what? You're just the <laughs> tallest person in the room. <laughs> wow. like, all these things. And he's like, you just have to be smarter than the fifth grader you're teaching or whatever. Yeah. And he's just killing this woman with just facts, and it's yeah. all gold. <laughs> and then he has a big bit about it later in his act. But I wonder if it came off that phone call, but he's just dropping gems, yeah. and they're all blown yeah. away. And he was close to shooting a special ah. at the end of his life. So I always wondered. Did you know he was sick or not? No one I, knew I didn't, I didn't Nobody know. knew. Nine years. Yeah. Were I mean, you still close with him? I mean, I don't know. I don't think I was ever like close to Norm. I just knew him a little bit for a really long time. I had done a, a Largo show with him a few years before he died. And, you know, he came in and he was so sharp. And he was so funny backstage and so nice. And then someone gives him a hit on a joint. And then... He just becomes norm. Like the the whole, and it was kind of sad because you could just tell he could have just crushed it if he stayed sober. Right. And there's like right. one hit, he just lost like 
half of it. Yeah. And and I was mad at my friend. Like, why are you giving a joint to Norm? And then he went on stage and he has like a decent set. I remember he was doing that stuff about OJ. You know, but the, oh, but the irony. Remember that bit? Yeah, yeah. He got yeah. caught for the shirts. Yeah. Not, you know, he went to jail for stealing shirts or whatever, not the murder. Yeah. Blah, yeah. blah, blah. And at the end of his set, he looks at the crowd and he's like kind of suddenly like very emotional. And he says, uh, you know, I'm a... Uh, over here, like it's 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 so nice. You people are so nice to me, and uh, and I walk over there, and it points to the wings, and and it's over, and then that, it, it ends, and then I'm just over there alone. But if I just stay out here, you know, it, like really feels good like, to be here with you, but but I have to, I have to go, and then he literally starts crying Whoa. on stage, and he just takes this long pause. He goes, I don't I don't know what to say, and then he just goes, I love you. And then he walked off. Wow! Off Yikes! And now looking back, knowing that he was sick, you know, you wonder what <sighs> he was thinking about and what all those moments were about and all the routines. Because there's interviews where he talks about really looking up to um, this actor. What's his name? Richard Farnsworth, the guy who mm. was in that movie where the guy rides the lawnmower across the state. Oh, it's called yeah. like Straight Story. Yeah, like, what else is he? He's in a ton of, isn't he in Misery too? Yeah, I, I mean, he was, I think he was a stuntman who became an actor. Um, Pull him up. Maybe David Lynch uh, directed that movie. Mm. Uh, or Gus Van Zandt, I think David Lynch. But he was talking about how much he admired him because he never told anyone he was sick. Oh, and yes. And he talked about it for about 10 minutes, like how that's the best thing you could do right. is not bother your family. Exactly. And so he talked about it, but as if it was somebody else. Yeah, wow. he had that whole, I saw. I heard him on a Chris Hardwick's podcast years mm -hmm. ago, and he's like, all these comics now, they have these one-man shows about having an illness, and he's like, yeah. that's not brave. Everybody calls him brave. He's like, no, it's brave to hold it in and not bother everybody with it. Yeah. Oh, you got cancer? Oh, everybody gets cancer. You know, that's not yeah. a big deal. I mean, it's a wow. big deal, but it's not, you're not special. Well, he, he, it reminds me of Siskel and Ebert because Siskel didn't tell anybody. Right. He told nobody that he was sick. And Roger Ebert, I guess, was really upset mm -hmm. that he never shared it with him. And then by the time he found out, he was very close to dying. And then when Roger Ebert got sick, he, he shared the whole experience oh, uh, with the world because he thought that that's what you do. But, you know, that's a... Yeah, a I, private decision. Yes. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's 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 that person's choice. I, I don't judge either way, but uh, right. yeah, my body, my choice. What was the joke that Norm had about uh, beating cancer? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. It's, isn't it something about like how it, it the cancer dies too, so it's a draw or something? Right, yeah. right. You're battling yeah. with cancer. It's like I think he lost. You know, <laughs> it's not really a battle. It's a losing fight. I can't remember, but it was yeah. great. Then his dad died, and he's like, "Your dad's in a better place. He's he's on the floor." Yeah. <laughs> That was a great bit. He's like, we're scared of Korea. I'm scared of my heart. You know, my <laughs> yeah. heart could kill me from inside. I mean, wow, brilliant yeah. stuff. It's so simple. You know, like uh, World War II, they attacked the world. You know? <laughs> and it's incredible. It's yeah. gold. Who do you think you are, Mars? Yeah, that was a great tag. Do you, you, were, you toured with Jim Carrey in the 80s, right? I did. I did, yeah. He, uh, you know, he was an impressionist, and he just didn't want to do impressions anymore. He just decided that he, he didn't want to become Rich Little. And, mm. and you know, he was playing Vegas. He would open up for Rodney. Rodney was one of his big supporters when he was like 19. Wow. And then he stopped for a while. He did a couple of movies. None of them did well. Uh, but just being in movies back then was probably big, It right? was big, but like if you got your shot, like he was in this movie Once Bitten, it was like a vampire I remember that. movie. I remember that. And, uh, I used to come on Comedy Central like twice a week. Was it like Lauren Hutton and him or something? Mm -hmm. And then... It bombed. He had a TV show uh, about like a cartoonist, uh, the Duck Factory, and that bombed. So all his like big breaks weren't working, and then he didn't know what to do. And I, I guess a manager said, "Stop doing stand up and just focus on your acting." Ooh. And, and then I think he was like Peggy Sue got married, yep. and, and he was trying to build that easy. career. And then out of the blue, he just fired the managers and went, "I shouldn't be doing stand up. That's totally wrong." And he decided to go back, do no impressions, and he went on stage every night. And did his act completely improvised. Like every night, he would just do a completely different set with no forethought. Crowd about. work or just riffing? 
R- I mean, riffing, yeah. Not crowd work, not where you're from. Just going in your own head, Whoa. into your own madness. Terrifying. It wasn't pretty, I heard. I, it was on the Comedy Store yeah. documentary he talked about. It. He said at one point he got in the piano, yeah. got out of the piano, just trying anything he could do to get a laugh. He would like lay in it, like <laughs> against the back wall, like the brick <laughs> yeah. wall, and he would just see how much he could get in the crack. And I remember he had a bit that he would like take off his shoe when he was bombing. And he would pretend to call his wife. Ah. And he would just go like, hi, honey. No, it's going great. They love me. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. We're not going to have to worry about uh, making ends meet anymore. Uh, uh, wow. And then he would start killing. Like for like right. six, seven minutes, he would kill. And then it would fall off again. Yeah. But after a couple of months, he started building something. And almost everything you see in movies like Ace Ventura and The Mask, he came up with on stage at uh-huh. that time, all the catchphrases, let me show you something, and all righty then, and yep. all, all those things were, yeah, it's Fire Marshal Bill, and right. were all things he did just to That's where he really time. broke, right? In, in Living Color? And in Living Color, yeah. And then a- Ace Ventura. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that in the theater with my mom. She's like, I don't get it. And I was like, this is the funniest thing I've ever seen. Oh, same here. I, saw, I remember my grandparents took me to Dumb and Dumber, and they oh. were just like old Jews. They were yeah. so mad. Yeah. Were, my grandma was like, that was the worst. They wanted to see Apollo 13 or something uh, like that. Uh, I talked uh, them into Dumb and Dumber. Yeah, good. They're like, well, I like Bob Hope. Yeah. <laughs> well, I remember my grandparents would see Buddy Hackett, and they'd be like, he's so dirty. And in my head, I'm like, oh, you, you're dirty. That's what you... Yeah. But... Uh, <laughs> you can yeah. be dirty. I mean, it Gilbert, doesn't matter. Filthy. Well, what about uh, in in the book? Letterman's talking about how he hates impressions. I feel like that was probably the yeah. vibe that that people like Rodney told him he was better than that, right? Well, I think that uh, Jim thought that I, I would assume that he thought that people thought he was corny in some way. Yeah. And the thing that I think he was wrong about was. He wasn't doing normal impressions. I mean, right. so Jim thought, oh, I'm turning into Fred Travelina or somebody. But what he was doing was like really innovative and demented yes. because he would just, for a lot of it, just do people's faces. Like he would just do Clint Eastwood and like he could change yes. his face. And, and then he would do James Dean. And he, I remember he used to do Bruce Dern. Wow. Which, which was another like crazy, he could just become <laughs> Bruce Dern's face. But I think in the beginning, maybe he was like also like singing a song as Sammy Davis Jr. Yeah. He, he had a whole on Golden Ponds, like Henry Fonda bit. Yeah. Uh, but then he's, it turned into like post-nuclear Elvis Presley impressions. <laughs> That's a great one. Jimmy Stewart uh, yeah. and the apocalypse. Yeah. And stuff and, like that. And so I would go out with him. And in the beginning, I remember we went to the Atlanta Punchline. and we Still did, there. Different we, location, but. Yeah, there. we did a week in Sandy Springs. And he, he didn't get booked back. Like oh wow, the, the response was no, you can't come back. Yeah, uh, and he was still great. Like anyone should go. Wait a second, that that was amazing. Even if it was a little hit and miss at the time, and then it just started murdering. And he did a special, and mm-hmm. and he he had the killer set. Yeah, you got to get over that hump. You yeah. got to find it. It's so weird to picture just Jim Carrey bombing. I mean, it's it, yeah. you know because he doesn't do stand up anymore. But yeah. then it's I feel like a lot of people don't even know he did stand up. It was also like not normal jokes. It was right. Uh, it was surrealistic, right? Yeah. In some way, and people had never really seen it, and he wasn't famous. So some nights people would he would just get the room, and then other nights it would be always hit and miss. He, he never like when he had the act would bomb, but mm. just there were certain nights where it was pandemonium, and then suddenly his Ventura hit, and then. He was he was Jim, and then he didn't want to do it anymore. And it's funny, it's three weeks ago. I, I did a Largo, and I and I heard that Jim had been on stage at the Bob Saget Memorial, and people said he was really funny, and he hadn't really been on stage at the store in like twenty years. And so I said, you know, I got a Largo coming up. You want to just come on stage and just chat? Like you don't have to do a set. We'll just like I'll just ask you questions. And he did. He came, and then I just asked some questions that I knew the answers to, like. You know, You're just like, please don't cry at the end of your set here. Please yeah. don't cry. I want this to go well. And then I asked him about Kinnison, and he had an amazing Kinnison story wow, and an amazing wow. Dangerfield story. And then, you know, the funniest person in the world. Like, right away, you go, there it is. If he ever wanted to do it, yeah, you know, he, he could do it very quickly. I, I hope he does. I think there is a chance at some point he, he might consider it. I think so, too. Because it's so fun. Yeah, and you get bored, and movies... Don't really scratch that itch, but but I will say Eddie Murphy always hints at coming back, and I, I think it's a bad idea. I think he's too much of a. I mean, he can do whatever he wants, but he's a legend. We have him up here in our minds, yeah. 
And to only get good, you have to get good. You have to bomb. So seeing Eddie Murphy bomb, I think, is too much for people. Well, it might be a news story because he's that famous. So if well, he has a bad true. set, it could be a new. And that's the tough yeah. thing. When you're that famous, that's why it's hard when you're already famous to be a killer right. stand-up. It's just hard. you got to work your way up. You I mean, you, I give you credit care. for doing so many seller sets because it's like yeah. there's no way around it. A lot of people just wouldn't put in the work. I mean, I think that you just have to go, I don't care if you write about my bad mm. sets. I mean, the perfect example, like for Eddie Murphy, is Mulaney. Right, so Mulaney decides to come back and do stand up after everything he's been through. Yep, and he goes and he does like the the wine. Uh, what's the name? City of the wine. Right? City wine. Yeah, and people write articles about it, and they they're quoting the set, and which is so messed up. Down. I think up. I don't think it's cool to quote a comedian's material if it's a work yeah. in progress. Yeah. Well, day one back. Yeah, but Mulaney's tough. He didn't care. He just said. I'm just going to keep going. And so they did write those articles like they would write the Eddie Murphy articles. And then. But the Eddie Murphy, Eddie Murphy hasn't stand up in like 35 years, has he? I mean, that that's the difference. Mulaney's been. You He's know, pretty yeah. funny, though. How, I don't know how bad the sets would be. That's I think true. that Eddie Murphy has so much charisma. He probably could. He, you know, he'd have some bumpy rides, but not that bumpy. That's true. But ultimately, people get bored of those articles and you go, yeah, OK, yeah. You've, you've written a lot of what I'm saying. People get bored of it. And then at some point after whatever, six months. Eddie Murphy has the monster set, but you have to want to do it because you got to want to do it's it. It's a crazy amount of work, and you got to get in the car, and you got to like exactly. It's so funny to picture somewhere. him at a cl- uh, like maybe he'll just do, do like a road club to work, and you're like yeah. Eddie Murphy I at the know. punchline in and Atlanta. He's put glasses on to read his notes. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna well, you be have weird. to love it, right? Like yeah, I remember. So it's, or you Seinfeld. have to really want eighty million dollars. Either yeah, one, exactly. <laughs> he probably has eighty. Yeah, yeah. But I saw the Seinfeld at Gotham, and he it was like you know when the pandemic was slowing down and. He was like doing his first sets in a, in a long time, and you can see he's so excited, yeah, to get up there. And I think you either have that or you don't, right? You either love it and you cannot stop that person. Like Kevin Nealon is so riotously funny. He's funny, and he loves it. I did a show with him recently. He he killed harder than I've ever seen him kill. Wow! But, but some people just they just start enjoying other things, which is fine. I mean, if you don't have that fire and you. Focus. I mean, he has like ten kids. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why it may not be worth his time. Sure, but you got to do it one set at a time. It's like getting buff. You know, you go. I want to yeah. be buff. You got to do the reps. You got to go to the gym. And I think a lot of people don't want to go to the gym. Yeah, they want to be buff. Yeah. What uh, when you do, were doing that? When you were working on it, were you doing clubs on the road, or were you doing theaters, or, what, or were you just working on it in the city or in L.A.? Or what when I was doing? working on the, the set for my special, yeah. uh, you know, I. I went to like the DC Improv, and I went to comedy on states. And oh wow, um, the classic. good ones. Yeah. yeah, I tried to go to places with the good crowds, and and but but most of it at the cellar. A lot of Largo shows. Yep. And and I tried to have some momentum into into shooting it, like you know, like on the road straight into the shoot. And I and I was happy with the you know with the set. I also you know in my head I literally thought. I'd love to do a special before I'm completely bald. <laughs> and I'd like to, like, while I look okay, I'd right. like to kind of get it all down at right. this stage of life. But also my kids were a certain age, and I feel like they both are out of the house now. And it, it captured a period of what life was and parenting and, you know, what was happening. So I'm, I'm glad that I got it done. Yeah, that special's called Judd Apatow, Thinning. <laughs> <laughs> and you also produced two. I may, how many specials did you produce? I know you did Gary and Chris Gethard and, and Ricky. Velez's. And Ricky. Okay, oh, I was going nice. to say, is there a theme of like depression or, or like darkness <laughs> that you look for? But Ricky <laughs> yeah. is not. He's not like that really. He's got much. anxiety stuff. Anxiety, yeah. but but it, but Gary. Well, Gary dark specifically moments. was yeah. about yeah the Great Depression. Yeah, and and that was an amazing set and killer and put him on the map. I think. Well, I mean, we've all known that he's the greatest. Forever, yeah. Yeah, but that was a very special set, and yeah. it was so funny and so vulnerable and open. And Chris Gethard's show, Career Suicide, was an amazing one man show about all of his struggles and suicide attempts. And wow. and it was a little bit more of a theater piece, and it's a, it's a really great HBO special. Um, He's that, a great storyteller. Yeah, uh, that our, my friend Michael Bonfiglio, who I co directed the George Carlin documentary with, he directed both of those Uh specials and i'm glad they're out there because you know both of them said you know when they were young there's nothing about depression out there there's nothing about mental health stuff to make you feel like 
you're not alone in things right. that are really hard. And mm. so just for that to exist, people watch it and they go, oh, there, there can be light at the end of the tunnel. There's a way through this. And just to know that you're not the only person suffering with it is a big deal. Oh, yeah. Yeah, comedy's come so far. Like, there's these Indian com- like, comedy's just new in India. And yeah. there's all these Veerdas. Indian guys. Veer Das. That's exactly what I was He's thinking He's in the of. bubble. The movie I oh, just Oh, there you go. Nice. He's a great guy. Yeah, I just saw him at the cellar the other night. But he'll he'll like rent out a theater and be like, I'm working on my new hour. And that's, I don't think there's a lot of clubs there, you yeah. know, and comedy's so new. They're almost like in the 80s in India. Mm. I think he said he was doing like big shows like in the woods. <laughs> like during <laughs> the go. pandemic, he would just like set up a thing outside. Oh, yeah. I did those uh, parking lot shows that hit the, yeah. the the high beams. If you really killed, you got yeah. the wipers. Yeah, was, did you enjoy those? Or No. Oh. I just had to get out of the house, had to get up. Yeah. I never want to do any, I never want to do a roof ever again. <laughs> I, they, it made me so depressed. Yeah. But, I did one like corporate thing on Zoom. Yeah. Like, it was like someone's rich person's birthday. And they had like a lot of big comics and the whole family's just like sitting on their couch Ooh. and we're like doing their act for them. And they were actually nice and like laughing. Like it made it not like a terrible thing. And I took it. I just gave the money to charity because I I just wanted to see what it was. <laughs> and it was a little too lucrative for, for uh, that kind of thing. And uh, but big people. <laughs> It's like five like really, I don't even know what to say who they were. Eddie but, Murphy. But, but, <laughs> and I was like, is this what it's become? And then other people would do Zoom shows where there's a hundred people on the Zoom and at first all their mics are kind of on. So if someone was just like talking to their friend, <laughs> oh, like right, that, right. you would hear that also. Oh. And then they had to figure out how to deal with that kind of shit. <laughs> yeah. I know there's always the old lady whose face is up against the screen and she's trying to figure it out. And she's like, how do I do this? And she's like talking over your act. Yeah. Brutal. That was a t- that was a dark time. Yeah, that was early and, days. I, and for people to just not make money. Yeah, I mean that's a long run for people to you know for the for people who you know if you don't have a lot of money in the bank and you're gonna have almost two years where like eighty percent of it goes away. I don't know how a lot of people survived. I mean I a lot of a lot of people in and a lot of restaurants yeah. closed and a lot yeah. of you know movie theaters. Yeah. And a lot of, yeah, a lot of stuff that. You know, we need entertainment and restaurants yeah. for an economy. It's terrible, you know? I was hoping more would quit. More <laughs> I feel like we have yes. more than before. I know. I've got, I'll get messages from comics sometimes like, uh, I just started comedy two years ago. I'm like, you started two years ago? <laughs> you started in March the of... peak. Of, yeah. You started the worst time yeah. in history? Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, that's interesting. I mean... You've had such an interesting career, man, because you've just done so many different types of things. I mean, yeah. I, it just, I just think of like the, the TV shows and the types of movies you made. I mean, working on something like The Critic and then making funny people. Like, you can't have two different types of yeah. comedy. Right. I mean, I just think, yeah, you always want to go like, what, what, what else could you do? Yeah. And not get stuck in the thing. Even this new movie, The Bubble, like, it's really like silly. It's like a Mel Brooks movie or I don't know. I mean, it's not really that style. I, I was thinking like Christopher Guest and then it kind of veered into a little of a Tropic Thunder type of thing. But it, it's, I don't mean this in a bad way, but it's like the dumbest movie I've made. Like it's All right. it's goofy. It's like. We need goofy it, right now. I showed it to Stiller. He goes, it's bonkers. And, <laughs> With a Z. <laughs> and and usually, usually like I'm trying to make things very emotionally grounded and then going, how funny can you be when the characters are very real? And this, I just threw that out the window for the first time. And so that's scary to go, oh, I don't have the uh, the grounding that usually makes me feel comfortable of how would a normal person behave. Right. Like it's scary to have strange characters who have completely different uh, ways of communicating that don't necessarily make sense. Sure. I, I mean, mean, we we haven't had a jerk in so yes, long and we yeah. I missed that kind of stuff that's why I think that Tim Robinson show oh, yeah. hit so hard because it's so funny. silly and wacky and kind of abstract he's so he goes so hard that guy it's so yeah. hard. it's it's like a level yeah. of vulnerability like people say like this yeah. this comic was so vulnerable I'm like that's ins- i remember nick yeah. vadra we used to do shows oh, like the creek so funny I don't know if you know nick but nick would go so high energy for like four people in the crowd <laughs> and i'd be like this is balls yeah i always loved that nick just had just balls big act outs yeah. for no payoff <laughs> that's yeah. a terrifying moment well, for four people he was yeah. hilarious i mean he is hilarious sure that's and, why people like say like you know how do you stay interested? Because at some point you you realize like, oh, I'm like 37 years into this. Mm. Wow. You know, it, and and if you add like interviewing people, it's like 40 years <laughs> of a full obsession. And, and it really is that it's always terrifying. Yeah. Like every second of it, it like my movie comes out on Friday the 1st. Yeah. it'll By the time this is out, it'll be yeah. out. 
I don't know if people are going to go like, oh, man, thank you for making me laugh. Or that is the stupidest, worst movie you've ever made. And that's why you do it. Yes. Because it's just it, you cannot hold on to it and make it like a stable life. Yeah, right, right. You just can't. You just you do not know what people are going to go for yeah. at any moment. And sometimes the thing that you love, people don't go for it. And then 15 years later, it pops up and you're like, what? People like the cable guy now? Cult classic. Right? I was going to get to that. You wrote the cable guy. I, I did, yes. I'm not credited, but I did like a, a lot of, of writing on the cable guy. I was the producer. So as, you know, as a producer, it's very hard to be credited as a wow. writer like the rules are that you have to change an enormous amount to to get the credit which always broke broke my heart because i was so proud of the, yeah. the writing on that uh and then people would laugh at me because i sued the writers guild because i said that the rule was not fair mm. because if someone who's not the producer rewrites a movie it's easier for them to get credited than if you're the producer and you rewrite the movie what? and it's there to protect people from getting screwed over by producers uh-huh. who are trying to get credit but it's ultimately unfair because why should it be a different yeah amount of work but anyway so the cable guy bombs but i'm suing the guild to get my name on it and everyone used to make fun of me. Like, you're really <laughs> suing to get your name on the movie right. and you did celtic pride too i did celtic pride another oh, underrated underrated movie oh, wow well the thing is colin quinn wrote celtic pride and it was it was not makeable because he just had all the NBA players doing drugs and there was gambling and like everything in it would never get the NBA to allow it to be made. To use the logos and everything. Yeah, you just couldn't do it. And it was really, really funny. And so I said, can I take a pass at it and see if I can get it makeable? And the funny thing about it is when we shot it, it was the last thing they did at Boston Garden before they tore it down. Oh, wow. wow. Like, they they tore shot it because of the movie? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so that was one of those that, you know, it totally was not what we hoped it would be. Yeah. You know, and, and we, but also it was so fun because we got to hang out at Boston Garden and like Bob Cousy's there. Like, right, so a lot of those people right. are around at that time. And, uh, and it just, you know, didn't all come together. But, it was a great. I I always felt bad because you know, Quinn wrote such a cool thing, right? You know, but it was just so edgy. Anytime you have a great idea for like football, and you're like, and then the football players doing coke, you're like, you can't make it. Really? Because unless you want to make up the yeah, but it's making up the teams. Yeah, you good know. Point, Remember good they point. did well. They did it in uh, they had that show on ESPN Playmakers back in the day, oh, and it was yeah. like the Sharks, their team. The Sharks, like, yeah, because yeah, these aren't real football teams, but the they're first doing and ten. Right, right. <laughs> Remember <laughs> Sports Night. That was a great show. That was good. Yeah. yeah. Classic. Was that Sorkin? Yeah. Oh. Only one season, I think. Damn, I think it was too smart yeah. for the room. Yeah. Well, it, was, it came at that weird time when I think you needed a laugh track to be in. Uh, they were like, what is this? It's yeah. just a situation comedy without right. laughing. Well, Undeclared, I think, suffered from that because there weren't single camera comedy shows. So right. we were on after like that 70s show. We just didn't fit in mm. anywhere. Damn. And so it, we just seemed odd. There's all these weird factors. I feel like we're getting out of that with, with internet a little bit. Because, you know, back in the day, it was like Seinfeld only made it because they, they put it on after Cheers randomly. You know, it, yeah. it probably wouldn't have caught steam if it wasn't on after Cheers. And that just took off. But, like, now with the internet, it's just here you go. Whenever you want. Yeah. Or Apple TV or streaming or whatever. It's just there. Yeah, it's just sitting there. Well, the, the habit of TV sucks now because you watch the whole show in a few days. So it's... Instead of 22, it's like six or eight, and you eat it up, mm-hmm. and then it disappears for like two years. Yeah. You don't remember what it was, yeah. and then you eat it up again, and then it shows up two and a half years later. Yeah. Like, it was fun like watching MASH every week, because right. you had a relationship with the show. Yes. It was like part of your life, and now uh, it's not like that. And, I, and someone was telling me that they basically decided that the idea of dropping it all at once really doesn't work for the audience, that they don't mm. like it. They don't mind like dropping two and next week dropping two, like maybe like not just one a week, mm. but that people like to be engaged for a couple of months. I think so. E- e- even if they they want to binge it, they they know it's because you forget it's like episode cookies. one. Yeah, it's like <laughs> you want them all. You don't remember but... the first cookie when you're on number eleven. Yeah, right. <laughs> you don't have that feeling anymore. But yeah, yeah I'm a big Curb nut, yeah. and Curb would come out every Sunday, and it was yeah. so did Succession. So it was yes. like my big night, Curb and Succession, yeah. the same night. Well, and Sopranos. You, and Sopranos. Sopranos was like the Godfather was coming out every week oh, for like best. seven, eight years. We we talk about Sopranos is our favorite show ever. You know, it's, Mad Men's another one where it's like it was every week, but also 
it was like two and a half years in between seasons. You'd be like, these kids are adults now. What the hell is that? <laughs> I know, happening? right? They're aging in a very <laughs> weird way. And sometimes like the end of one season, the, the first episode, the next season is the next day. And the yeah. kid's grown a year and a half. He's <laughs> got a mustache. Right. We don't want to keep you here because we know you got the uh, Fallon. Are we, oh, are we all right on time? That flew well, by. We're not because I have to go on the Tonight oh. Show right now and <laughs> and and push things and and try to be sharp. Well, you were Hell you yeah. were. This is a great episode. Uh, I, I'm I'm only I've only read like four or five of the interviews so far, but I can't wait to finish this great book. Yeah, uh, love the first one, so I'm excited for this one. Yeah, love it. It's really awesome, and uh, I can't wait to see the movie, man. Netflix, yeah. uh, the bubble. Yeah, bubble. Carlin Doc coming May, out in May, and and I I know you guys know most of Judd's work, but you know we have a lot of diehard comedy nerds who listen to this, so this this is your demo, man. Yeah. <laughs> Before you yeah. go, one comic you hate. No. <laughs> <laughs> I can, I'm sure I can find one. Besides Cosby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Too easy. <laughs> Thanks so much, Judd. Thank you, Judd. Thanks, guys. You're the man. Sunday's the day for my next spender. A bit of Pivarecki, know the beer juice close. I've had a little too much bourbon And Norman's talking shit about the fucking punk And I get down in the same way Up on the roof like a cop's coming And naked Samuel is feeling dangerous I'm out to lunch here in New Orleans This woman doesn't look like I remember her And I get down in the same way Oh, uh, what a great episode, guys. Thanks for Unreal. listening. Uh, we got a bunch of road dates coming up. I'll be at the Brea Improv Woo! Uh, April 28th through 30th. I'll be in L.A. That, sh- that show sold out, so I think we're going to add a second one. Small venue, but nice. I'm sure we'll be doing something in L.A. together if we yeah, can figure yeah. the time. Uh, I'm adding... Oh, this comes out the next week. Wait a minute. Never mind. Adding what? Oh, I'm going to add, a, uh, I think, a Gotham week. Oh, oh, April. oh, that's but a great that idea. Passed. Yeah. Um, I don't want the stress of another theater show. I just want to do it. <laughs> I was about it. to say. No, no, no. We got uh, Zanies in Nashville, Albany, uh, Toronto. It's a second show added. First one sold out. We got uh, Providence, Chicago taping. I hope to see you there. Hell yeah. Uh, at the Den, we got... Uh, I'm all over the place. Just just go to the website. I can't read anymore. Cleveland, Tampa, samurel.com slash shows. Love ya. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm all over the road. Uh, Phoenix at Stand Up Live. Big room, so come on out. Great club. Great club. Calusa, California. It's a casino. Lord knows that'll be wacky. Denver, some theater. Uh, I think it's called the Paramount. Addison Improv Comedy Club in Dallas. Love that room. Classic. Love that town. Bricktown Comedy Club in OKC. Another great. great one. Yeah. Uh, San Jose Improv coming up. Huge. Huge room. I'm cool there in town. August, I think. Yeah, huge room. Uh oh. Stand up live in Huntsville and uh, Minneapolis. I, I spent a week there one night. <laughs> Pantages Theater, Minneapolis, Chicago at the Vic, Cleveland, uh, Irvine. All kinds of good dates. MarkNormanComedy.com. Thanks for tuning in. Make sure to uh, tell your friends about the pod. I hope you enjoyed this one. Pick up Judge Book. It really is. I'm only like a few into it, and it's, it's I great. can't speak into it. Into it. It's great. The, Inuit is an Eskimo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Inuit. A lot of, lot of great stuff uh, today. So, uh, yeah, we might be drunk pod at gmail.com if you want to send us emails, questions. Uh, bits, yeah, drinks, Rex, whatever you want. Peeves, whatever you want. We'll take it. So tell a friend, get on board, have a drink, or don't, and we'll see you on the road. <laughs> <laughs>